Good afternoon. This is Shelley Feist with the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We are uh, kicking off this wonderful new year with a terrific four-part series on behavior change, a webinar series that you'll learn more about in a minute. I want to welcome you um, to the webinar. Thank you for being with us, and let's get started. Uh, we are thrilled to bring this topic to you. We are the Partnership for Food Safety Education, and our work is to develop and promote effective education programs to reduce foodborne illness risk for consumers. We're a nonprofit organization, and we rely on grants and donations to operate. We're going to go over a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we love the question and answer part of the, of the webinar. And so to ask a question, we do ask that you type it using the question box function, which is on the right of your screen. Uh, also, after the webinar, you'll receive a brief survey will pop up. Please fill it out because it's extremely important to us to have your feedback about how we can improve our webinars for our audience. We are offering continuing education units today for, from CDR and NEHA. And we've made it very convenient for you to get your certificate from the sidebar here on GoToWebinar. It is under the handouts box. So if you look there, you would be able to find your certificate. In addition, after the email, after the webinar, there'll be an email. Um, where you can access the certificates. And when the webinar recording goes up at fightback.org under our events tab, you will find both the recording and PDFs of the certificates. So those are multiple ways you can get them. If you try to email us and ask individually about getting the, the certificate, it will take us a while to get back to all the emails. So please try to get that um, from the webinar or one of these other ways. You will want to make sure you get that. So I, I mentioned that we're doing a four-part series on behavior change. And this is very exciting and really stems from uh, the conference that our organization, the Partnership for Food Safety Education, held last January that was titled, um, it was, our, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was titled Advancing Food Safety Through Behavior Change. And that is how I came to be in contact with Kelly, who you're going to hear from today. And we, Kelly is given much credit for working on this series. And as you see, they're spread out throughout the year leading up to October. And we're really looking forward to this. And I'm sure you will, too, uh, be interested in these multiple theories of behavior change and then a great recap of, of these theories and how to apply them to food safety education and consumers. Um, that will happen in October when we wrap up the series. I'm, again, Shelley Feist. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We're thrilled to have Kelly Dennings with us today um, and Andrew Lentini. Uh, to tell you a little bit about Kelly, uh, as I mentioned, she has a role in the entire series, and she has a very special role today presenting on the topic of social marketing to change behavior, community-based social marketing to change behavior. Kelly Dennings is a results-driven change agent with over 17 years of project management and leadership experience. She is Action Research's uh, Director of Social Marketing and Kelly is president of the Social Marketing Association of North America. She's currently working on her master's in public health at the University of South Florida. And prior to joining Action Research, she worked at the state and national levels conducting various social marketing, social media, and traditional advertising projects around recycling and forest conservation. And in her spare time, she enjoys taking pictures of water towers. So we will take questions on that also, if you care to post <laughs> them in the question box. Uh, let's see. So let's move forward here. Um, I think we're going to first hear from Andrew. 
and Thanks. he's representing the, the uh, Social Marketing Association of North America. I just have a couple of things to tell you about SMANA. And the Social Marketing Association of North America is a membership organization serving the professional needs of behavior change agents in Canada, the Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, and the United States. We incorporated in June of 2016. For those working globally, SMANA is a regional group that is part of a larger federation through the International Social Marketing Association. There are similar groups in Europe, Australia, and soon Africa. We advance behavior change for social good. Our members are change agents from all sectors, social marketers, behavioral scientists, and economists, conservation psychologists, environmental educators, behavior change communicators, cause marketers, entertainment educators, health communicators, design thinkers, the list goes on. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Our membership promise is to build a stronger legacy and community of practice, provide assurance that our efforts are scientifically rigorous and informed by practice, facilitate opportunities for networking and learning, and to advocate for the advancement and use of social and behavior change strategies. Next slide, please. Membership benefits include guaranteed admission to regional networking events, support of the social marketing listserv, advanced access to six webinars per year, ask the experts one-on-one -on -one sessions, and discounts on conferences and journals, specifically 20% off of the social marketing quarterly journal. We have practitioners, students, and academics involved from both the environmental and health fields. I invite you to visit our website at smana.org for more, gener more information. Regular membership dues are $55 and students pay only $30. Joining Smana gets you simultaneous membership in the ISMA. Now is the time to get involved and help build and mold this new, new organization. Invest in our profession and help support the larger social marketing community. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to, to be doing this with, with your organization. Um, so we're going to start off with a poll because we love to know who's here and who is finding this a really compelling topic. So uh, the poll will be launched and, and we'll leave it open for a little bit. And please participate because we love to see the majority of people participate. Okay, if you haven't taken the poll, please take it so we can close it and let everybody know who has joined us today. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close the poll. Thank you all for participating. We're gonna show you the results of the poll. Terrific. Thank you all for, for participating. It's a lot of fun to know who's with us and, and, and uh, experience this community of people who are working on consumer behavior change. Kelly, I gave you uh, your intro already. I'd be happy to repeat it. <laughs> and um, I'll leave out the part that you're somewhere nice and warm and no possibly of snow. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Kelly, for being with us on this topic and for all the work you've done. Um, to help us bring this series Aww. to the uh, food safety educators. Well, thank you, Shelley. That that's a very sweet introduction and a very warm introduction and welcome. And I'm curious to see who all the others are. Clearly, we missed some categories there. Um, but I want to thank Andrew and Smana for for helping to put on this series. And honestly, Shelley, it's just been such a pleasure over the last year working with you to to build this series. And um, the, the, the um, conference that you put on last year struck me as just very forward thinking. And there was a session um, about the behavior change wheel. And if folks haven't Googled this, you might want to, but a presenter spoke about 93 different behavior change strategies. She didn't talk about all of them, but they're, um, they have kind of categorized these. 
And so that was really the impetus that Shelley and I had for continuing to do this series so that you would hear about a few of the different strategies available to you for behavior change. So the series is very exciting. Um, and I also want to just kind of uh, say a personal note. So ironically, that very same week, I met Shelly at the conference. My best friend's 11-year-old child had been infected with E. coli from some tainted almond butter, and he was in Johns Hopkins PICU. And um, that unfortunately turned into the life-threatening HUS, and he is recovered now, but he is waiting for a kidney transplant. So just this topic of food safety, consumer food safety, is also very, very personal to me. And it kind of all, all came together um, last year for me. Let me tell folks a little bit about action research. So we specialize in changing behavior for the public good by applying marketing and social science research to outreach programs that promote clean, healthy, and sustainable communities. Since its founding in 2001, action research has gained international attention as a pioneer in applying community-based social marketing to develop effective public outreach and behavior change programs for dozens of governmental agencies, nonprofit organizations, and private companies that seek to promote sustainable behaviors. So when we talk about how to change behavior, um, social science has been studying human behavior for over 100 years. We know how people can make decisions and the underlying motivations that motivate someone to do something. The first point I want to make is that behavior matters. So many issues we face are rooted at some level of human behavior. For example, heart disease, lung cancer, obesity, and the behaviors that lead to these, healthy eating, exercise, or smoking, are really tough to tackle. There are technology solutions working to address food safety, such as microbial interventions, food tracking, or pasteurization and irradiation. You guys are sure are much more knowledgeable in this than I or potential policy solutions like FDA's Food Safety Modernization Act. These strategies should be integrated together with individual behavior change. So behavioral solutions are an important part of solving the issues, and we really need to get people to take voluntary action. Next slide. So not only does behavior matter, but the behavior matters. So these could be one-time actions or some that are repetitive. For example, that initial um, hurdle of purchasing your first meat thermometer versus checking expiration dates daily. Even within a domain like food safety, there are many different behaviors we could promote, all that come with a variety of behavior, uh, barriers and benefits. And barriers can vary in cost, difficulty, or other obstacles. So if behavior is important, how do we change it? Next slide. So there are information intensive campaigns that normally focus on increasing knowledge and improving awareness. Um, and we're gonna talk with how these um, information intensive campaigns can be improved upon or um, supplemented with other social science topics. So next slide. For information um, or knowledge, I'm, I'm sorry, the thinking is here that if we tell people what to do, they'll do it. So here we could have like the example of flyers and PSAs, and it makes the assumption that somebody doesn't act because they don't know to do it. However, we know that al knowledge alone does not necessarily change behavior. For example, I personally may know that one of the best ways to defrost meat is in the refrigerator, but due to time constraints, sometimes I don't always do that. So the awareness category here assumes that if we um, make people really care to the point of an attitude change, they're gonna change their behavior. Again, the research shows that having an appropriate attitude towards something does not directly lead to action. I'm sure we can all think of things where we have you know, very positive attitudes toward it. For me personally, it's like blood donation, um, but I personally have never given blood. So I have a very high awareness and positive attitude, but have not done it. So moving on to economic argument. This is a common line of thinking in the energy, water, and transportation sector, maybe not so much here in food safety, but often the belief is, is that people just knew it was in their economic best interest, they would act. So moving on. So um, there is an evidence-based alternative to these um, intensive knowledge-based campaigns to increase behavior, and we think that it's um, community-based social marketing. So I know this webinar series is going to introduce you to a lot of behavior change strategies, and that's awesome. 
we really want you to give want to give you a bunch of tools in your toolbox that you can pick for the various circumstances that you're in. But specifically about community-based social marketing today, this borrows concepts from social psychology and combines it with the social sciences. In the book, Fostering Sustainable Behavior, the authors define community-based social marketing as a localized, step-by-step, data-driven process where you work to remove the barriers and enhance benefits. And we really want you to focus on outcomes and not just outputs. So really keeping in mind that behavior change and not just tracking the number of impressions. It's been used for topics like energy, water, recycling, and public transportation. And just to be clear for those folks on the phone, hopefully you're not gonna be disappointed, um, but community-based social marketing is different from social media. Social media like Facebook and Twitter would be a strategy that we might use in community-based social marketing, um, but we are gonna talk about something different. All right, next slide. I'll go through these quickly, Shelley, but there's five steps to, um, uh, doing the community-based social marketing uh, strategic process. The first one is that you really select your behavior. And then the next one is you research the barriers and benefits associated with that behavior. And then next, you develop a strategy associated with those barriers and benefits. And you're gonna pilot test at a small scale to identify any kinks in your strategy. And then finally, you're gonna implement broadly and uh, conduct monitoring and evaluation throughout. So now we're just gonna go through those steps in a little bit more detail. So for selecting the behavior, the first step is about the strategic selection of this behavior. And with CBSM, we spend a good deal of time thinking about what behavior makes the most sense to promote. So we first start with our desired outcome. So for example, in this situation, let's say we wanna prevent consumer-based foodborne illnesses. And then we talk about, well, who are our audiences that contribute to that outcome? So of course, some of you may work with caregivers, mothers, young adults. And then we're, we would um, talk about what are the different behaviors that contribute to that outcome? Again, this could be not disinfecting counters, not separating raw meat from ready to eat foods. So you can see how there's a lot of things that go into this, the um, framework. And we want to be very strategic about that. So you're going to pick a behavior that is um, linked to your outcome. If you, if you don't, you're really never going to get to your goal. And we want to make informed choices about our hunches. And we, we want to make sure that to the extent possible, we use data and research to inform our decisions. Next slide, please. So um, first, we start by creating a list of behaviors that um, cause the outcome. So many folks think of the outcome as the behavior, but let's keep with this example of preventing a consumer-based foodborne illness. So this is your outcome, but washing your hands could be one of the potential behaviors. So you also want to make sure that it is non-divisible, meaning that the behavior can't be broken down any further. So again, you'll see I'm kind of using this uh, example throughout. You could promote hand washing as your behavior to your outcome of decreasing consumer food-based illnesses, but we wanna tell people you know, how long they should wash their hands, in what temperature they should wash their hands, should they use soap? So you, you wanna get into that detail when you talk to people about these behaviors. You also want to avoid strategies as your desired behavior. So your goal is not to read a pamphlet. Although, although this may increase knowledge, it won't get you to your outcome, at least not very quickly. Next slide. So uh, we wanna look at four factors to prioritize the behavior. So on the screen here, you'll see impact, probability, penetration, and applicability. And um, when you work through this process fairly detailed, you actually can put numerical values associated with this. So if we had five different behaviors that could get us towards um, impacting a food-based illness with a certain audience, we would essentially try to pick the best of the best behavior that is going to get us to the most impact based on um, a, a fairly detailed analysis of the things that you're seeing here on the screen. So we're gonna pick high behavior, behaviors with high impact, high likelihood, and there needs to be some room to move people. Next slide. So the core of community-based social marketing is its audience orientation. It seeks to understand what people want and what they do and don't do. 
The bottom line is not to simply enhance awareness or change attitudes, as we mentioned, but to motivate and empower people to take the desired behavior. So to that end, social marketing makes the distinction between having an impact and having a lasting impact. The goal of behavior and benefit research is to learn why people aren't engaging in the desired behavior. So barriers and benefits can be real or perceived. And you'll see on here there are internal and structural behaviors or, or barriers. Um, and there may be multiple ones, so you're going to need to prioritize, again, which ones are um, the ones that you should be focusing on. You'll notice here that I have both knowledge and attitudes listed. So even though we talked earlier about how knowledge and attitudes alone may not lead to behavior change, however, being misinformed or having a negative attitude can still be barriers that need to be overcome for a successful program. The issue is that you still need to address the other barriers that people face, such as lack of time or motivation to get them to action. And I am one of these people after that conference, I learned so much about the different behaviors that could be done to prevent food safety. Next slide. So to learn about your audience's barriers and benefits, we recommend conducting literature reviews, focus groups, observational studies, surveys, or polls to learn more about your audience and how best to communicate with them. So in prepping for this webinar, I found a research paper from 2003 that showed food safety observational research was the most reliable but only used 17% of the time. So I highly recommend you use this. It sounds like it's a great um, method for the topic that you guys work on. And the four most common reasons for skipping barrier identification, which you're probably all familiar with, is the belief that maybe the behavior, the barriers are already known, time pressures, we all of course need to do things faster, financial constraints, doing it with less money, um, and perhaps management doesn't support the research. So I really encourage you to not let these stop you from doing some kind of research. Even small amounts will save you time and money in the end. Um, I have been there. So um, even if it's talking with some uh, friends at church or doing a quick A-B survey, you know, to a list that might be already very well known to you is a little bit better than doing nothing at all. So I think we might have a poll here, yeah, for us to understand some of the kinds of research that you guys have done before. Please take the poll. This is great information for all of us, and we will show you the results when we close it. But take a moment to take the poll. Okay, so let's uh, close the poll and show you all what type of research you all have been involved with. Um, this is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Terrific. So what it's showing to me, at least, is that you guys value research, have the time, and hopefully the money to do some of this, this work, maybe not as often as you would like. Um, but again, I would um, recommend you maybe look at this idea of observational studies based on um, based on the literature that I read in regards to your, um, your topic in particular, because so often with surveys or focus groups, um, people will tell us what they think they, they want us to hear, um, but that observational research is very non-biased. So, yeah. all right. Good advice, thank you. We'll move on to the next okay. slide. Okay, thank you. So, um, step three of the community-based social marketing framework as you'll remember um, includes removing barriers enhancing motivation so only after we've gathered this information about our audience uh, do we move on to defect uh, um, building our effective strategy so next slide so um, to remove the barriers um, we this graph really represents how we can remove the barriers and enhance the benefits so 
The barriers are shown here um, by a wall that really keeps you from getting to the goal. And the wavy lines represent motivation towards that goal. So you have to have some level of motivation or there's no movement towards the goal. And one way of doing that is to remove the barriers. And it's way more effective to do those simultaneously, which is identified in um, letter B. So if you increase the motivation, which is the wavy lines, and decrease the little wall, which is barriers, you can get to behavior change more quickly. So next slide. Another thing that we utilize um, to be more effective in these strategies to, is to lever personal con contact whenever possible. So next slide. So um, this graph is showing how generally high reach, low behavior change items like mass media can raise awareness and knowledge. But over time, we might want to increase our personal touch or reach with the individual, which has a direct correlation to an increase in behavior change. So you can see on the right-hand side, well, my right-hand side, I guess it's everyone's right-hand side, uh, the information and awareness changing campaigns have high reach but low behavior change. And as you move up the curve um, to a one-on-one -on -one personal contact, you're going to see a higher behavior change. Um, but of course, it's much harder you know, and more expensive to, to do that, um, but you will get to better impact. So I know wow. you kind of have to have to weigh these things. Um, and so really also the other thing that you can do is, is various things along that curve. So there might be things that you can do um, in, in both sides. Yeah, Kelly, I want to say, share an observation, which is that we know from the backfighters that a lot of them are doing work at that one-on-one -on -one and small group discussion. So I think that's great. That is great. All right, next slide. So lastly, we um, use tools from social science. And so um, the next slide shows a number of different tools. Um, and I am not gonna go over all of these. I'm gonna go over a few of them today, um, but you'll also have a um, survey question. So I hope that you do take the evaluation at the end of the webinar. And we're asking you on that to tell us which of these other potential behavior change strategies you would be interested in learning more about. And then some of our future speakers uh, may, may address those. So we can not get to everything today, but if you tell us what interests you, we hope to get to them in future, future webinars. But I'm just gonna go through a couple of them. So the next slide um, talks about prompts. So social scientists say that the problem with humans sustaining an activity is that we often forget and the use of prompts to remind us of something can work to change behavior. So when you use a prompt, you wanna make sure it's easily noticeable, self-explanatory, in close proximity to where the activity occurs and is always promoting positive behaviors. So the example you'll see on the screen here, whoop, sorry, I was just gonna talk about that picture a little bit, is um, the seafood watch card. So this is something that you can put in your wallet or your purse and it tells you which fish are sustainably harvested. So when you're at a restaurant, you have it right there so that you can compare it to the menu. The next one, um, I believe we're gonna talk about norms. So this is really when you look outside of yourself to what other people are doing to guide your decision and your actions. If you observe someone you like or respect doing an activity, you're more likely to want to do that same activity. Um, and there are two types of norms. There are injunctive, which is what people approve of, so it's important to show as much as possible that others are in line with your goals. And the other is descriptive. This is what people are doing. And the danger here is that um, the perception can be reality. So if people are really not doing the behavior you want, um, you need to try to help change those descriptive norms. But the um, graphic on the slide here is a great use of norms in a, in a message. So most Montanans, three out of four, wear seatbelts. Now, we caution you against using normative messaging if the number is not high. Again, you don't want a, a boomerang effect, which is um, if a large majority are already participating in your desired behavior, you can use that to bring people along. Um, but on the flip side, if you're advertising that nobody is participating, it will undermine your goal. So just kind of keep that in mind. Next slide. So social scientists say that by giving a commitment to something, it changes the way that person perceives themselves. 
And we also like to be consistent. So once a person commits to something, they're more likely to follow through. If they don't, that leads to this thing called cognitive dissonance, and we just kind of feel awkward with ourselves. Um, small commitments can lead to larger ones. Written commitments can lead to, um, written commitments are better than verbal, and public commitments can be the best. So the example here, I love this example. It uses a number of different uh, strategies, but it shows how you're, you know, kind of one of 26,000 that's pledging to give your commitment to being a healthier individual. All right, next slide. Um, this is just, I'm gonna kind of move through this one pretty quickly. So as you um, do communication, which we all do, and it's not necessarily a social science tool, I'm sure you're all very comfortable with segmenting your audience, and that can now be done on the barrier, the action, demographics, and message. Next slide. So um, prior to implementing any strategy, it's really best to test the program. Um, and this is what we do when we pilot. Um, it allows you to refine the program until it's effective. You can find alternative method, methods to be tested against, one each, against each other. And when we talk about piloting, um, we really recommend that you use a control group. So this allows you to say that something that imp in, impacted your um, campaign was not due to outside forces. And so you really are able to say that it was due to the intervention that you um, implemented. And this, of course, piloting can also demonstrate to funders the worthiness of implementing the program on a broad scale. Next slide. So the final step here in um, community-based social marketing, this slide kind of really brings it all together. We want you to evaluate your program on a regular basis and tweak it as needed. And um, I know Fightback has done a lot of work on evaluation and there's been some other webinars about that. So, so you have a lot of great tools already. And um, you're, you're most likely going to use some of the similar strategies that you use to identify the barriers and benefits. Um, and again, just remember that asking somebody if they change their behavior isn't necessarily always the best. So if you can do those observational studies, um, it might be the uh, Cadillac type research that you can get. Um, and then I always like to use a logic model. So if you're not familiar with that, it really just walks through inputs, outputs, outcomes, and impacts. So that might be a, another helpful tool. All right. So these are just some additional resources. You're going to get this in the handout, I'm assuming, um, and you can peruse those um, uh, at your leisure when we're done with the webinar. And then I think I have a few minutes here, um, uh, and the references that are noted throughout the webinar are here on the screen also uh, for more information about community-based social marketing. And then I think I'm just going to run right into some... Oh, one more slide here, sorry. This is action research. So if you want to reach out to us or have any more questions, feel free, my email's there on the screen. And then, all right. So um, I also wanted to run through a few case studies specific to family uh, uh, food safety. So I am not an expert in these, um, I am, you know, have just read them and I'm uh, recapping them here for you today, but you'll see that I notated and gave you all of the um, citations so you can go back and read these more in depth. Um, but anyway, the first one here that I wanted to talk about was four day throwaway. So staff at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln conducted research on the standard for consumer food safety behaviors, clean, separate, cook and chill, ultimately deciding that that one behavior that they would focus on would be to throw away leftovers after four days. So they followed that great example of picking a, a very um, specific behavior. And their audience was families with young children. And they conducted a focus group. And from the focus group, they showed that um, using safe food handling practices and avoiding inconvenience were the benefits of preventing foodborne illnesses. But childcare duties, time, and knowledge were the barriers. And um, participants believed that children were susceptible to foodborne illnesses, but perceive, perceived that the severity was very low with just some GI discomfort as the primary outcome. And they had a lot of confidence in preventing foodborne illness, um, especially when they had personal control over the food handling. But they had low knowledge scores and reported practices uh, revealed that this was really kind of a false sense of confidence. Um, so they did some really great barrier and benefit research with this program. 
Um, so uh, the next, oh, and then they use the health belief model just really quickly there. Um, if you guys are familiar with that, I won't go into detail. But on this slide, you'll see here that the campaign included marketing techniques like a mascot, magnet, um, poster, TV spot, and a website. And they had an associated social media marketing campaign with YouTube videos, Facebook, Twitter, and an iPhone app. Um, so these were kind of the strategy components that they had to four-day throw away. And on the next slide, um, they, they also did an evaluation, which was great. So they did intercept surveys that were um, conducted at grocery stores in six cities. And they had a control group. They had three control sites and three test sites. And a total of 600 participants completed the survey. And of the 300 that were surveyed in the test sites, 24% provided unprompted or prompted awareness of the campaign. 50% of participants from the test locations reported throwing away leftovers within four days after preparation as compared to just 38% in the control group. So this is a great model of you know, identifying that specific um, behavior for your outcome, doing barrier and benefit research, picking a strategic audience, and then building out the strategies and doing an evaluation. So I found one additional case study that I wanted to run by um, with you guys. So this one was actually done in Wales and they, their focus was being um, to prevent cross-contamination of microorganisms from raw chicken to prevent preparation services, uh, or uh, cross-contamination of microorganisms from raw chicken to food prep surfaces and ready-to-eat foods. So again, here they used observational research and the behaviors that they monitored were hand washing, the use of separate chopping boards and proper placement of raw chicken packaging. So the audience was female, 60 to 75 years old, and they were asked to come into a test kitchen to cook a meal. So this is like so exciting to have this ability to do this. But I think people came in thinking that they were gonna you know, make a chicken salad. And while they were cooking, they were being observed on food safety. So six weeks later, these folks came back in and they were asked to come to the test kitchen again and cook chicken salad again. And there was a control and a, um, intervention group, which is kind of what you're seeing here on the screen. But uh, what they found was between the first and second test kitchen, or I should say, then the intervention began. So between the first time they came into the test kitchen and the second time, an intervention was conducted in that treatment community. And this included leaflets, posters, fridge magnets, a TV documentary, and newspaper articles. So um, the results showed that the treatment participants appeared to have improved immediately after the intervention. So when they came back to that second week test kitchen, they were you know, better doing food safety. However, after a period of four to six weeks after that initial improvement, um, it was not maintained. So the authors of this study said, you know, really these one-off campaigns may result in short um, improved behavior change, but not really in the long term. So as you work with funders and within your organizations, you know, I know it's so hard, but it is really important that we kind of have these strategies implemented over time. And that really gets to that long-lasting behavior change. All right, so I went through that really quickly, and I, I do have some other case studies for you. I'm not going to go through them. This one was conducted um, on a university campus, and you see the citation here. Uh, they use the stages of change theory. And then the next slide, I believe, includes um, some additional food safety um, behavior change research that I found. The first one here is a systematic review. So they did um, looked at a lot of old reports and uh, found kind of the best of the best. And so I really you know, recommend you if, if you're really more interested in this and want to know specifically about some of the work uh, and the other research that's been done around food safety and uh, community-based social marketing and behavior change, there's some citations here for you. Kelly, I thank got you us so in on much. Time. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was uh, fantastic and such good information. I assume the whole audience has many questions for you. We're going to move into questions. Remember, please type the questions in and then 
we'll um we'll pull some out that are you know maybe hopefully advance this topic of community based social marketing um, so please put in your questions. Anyone have a questions on this topic of social marketing? Um, Kelly, as you can see, is expert on it. Um, and I think really gave some good examples from food safety. Kelly, why don't you, um, I don't know, if, you know, kind of doing this prompted you to think of some ways that we can all improve our practice. You mentioned observational research. Um, I think that you're correct that one of the issues there is the expense of it. Um, right. Do you have some practical tips for, or example that you're aware of? I, I mean, you gave a couple of things. I think that is a challenge many of us face. And then, right. and then there's, you know, the approvals you have to get um, to do that kind mm -hmm. of work. Yeah, I mean, um, I, we get this question a lot of kind of, you know, how you can do this with a shoestring budget. And um, so I would say one, a, a literature review is great. That's kind of why I wanted to provide some of those resources and references to people so that um, you don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel. There's others that have looked at either some of the initial barriers that people face or a way to segment your audience. So a literature review can be a, an inexpensive way. Um, there's also a, a really great strategy that can be inexpensive called journey mapping. And it was listed on the slide, I believe, but it's where you follow an individual um, through a process. So again, it's observational in nature um, and it might be, um, a test kitchen or it just might be their own kitchen or it might be when they grocery shop or what have you but you can find various pain points associated with the behavior you seek so um, if people are at the store trying to buy something and you know the expiration dates are confusing them or they're not sure which meat thermometer you know you know just kind of observing them and watching them and and asking them questions as they're trying to purchase something um, might be able to allow you to understand the, the person's mind and then build messages around the things that they're struggling with. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a sample size of one or two maybe, so, but um, it might help you get a little bit further even if you don't have money or you know, can't go through IRB to get you know, full approval for a you know, large comprehensive study or something like that. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Linda, which I'm interested in too. You you talk about, you know, how you should implement a campaign over time for lasting impact. Um, you know, what might parameters on that be? You know, how how long is, how much time <laughs> is required for your campaign to have lasting impact? What are yeah. the factors we should be aware of there? So um, Action Research recently did um, a literature review for an organization that was interested in this very same question. So they couched it as backsliding. So how frequently do you need to communicate with your audience before they begin to backslide? And when we tried to find research around this, there is a good body of research in the energy field. So um, utility companies and, you know, other organizations like that that might have a little bit more money had done interventions where they came back after one month, after six months, after a year, and they were able to track how much um, backsliding or uh, how many people had reverted back to their original behavior. And you'll remember that one of the slides was about prompts. So, you know, one of the things with behavior change is that we often forget, you know, we either do get complacent and we slide back into our original behavior. Um, so what we found with that research was that you really needed to at least touch your audience once a year, or they were going to backslide to the point of, you know, either halfway going back to the behavior that they were at or all the way going back to their original behavior. So, um, you might want to at least try to reach out to people once a year. I think that's a good heuristic at least uh, for going forward or you know, budgetary planning and things like that, that if you're gonna 
put out a flyer or you know do a, a consumer outreach event it kind of at least be once a year I would say is a good good model yeah and uh, I again I'd encourage other you all to join the the full participate in the full series um, for our own reinforcement of our own learning but we had a question from Natalie you might be able to address quickly and that's probably the last one we'll get to uh, can Natalie asked, can you talk about a strategy you use to choose the right behavior change theory? And of course, we really didn't talk about all of them today. But how, you know, maybe how does action research choose a behavior change theory from which to base, you know, campaigns like this? Right. Yeah, so um, uh, action research specifically focuses on just community-based social marketing. So that would, I guess, would be kind of the framework or the theory that we use. But I know in the health community and more maybe traditional social marketing, there are like the health belief model, um, diffusion of innovation, stages of change. Um, so we didn't really go into that. But I would say it all kind of depends on um, really in any of those theories, you're going to do research to identify, again, these barriers and benefits, the pain points to getting your audience to what they want. And if you find that there's uh, just really bad norms, you know, that the community doesn't support it, then maybe you want to go, you know, diffusion of innovation and find early adopters and, you know, change agents within a community to help improve the, um, the campaign. Or if you find that they have a high amount of knowledge, but it's just, um, not convenient or there's an economics associated with it, you know, then maybe you'd want to pick a different um, framework or model that addresses that barrier. So um, I, I would say kind of identify maybe those pain points and, and maybe in your research, ask about all of those different things and then find out which ones were the ones that they're struggling with and then use that um, model or theory to build the campaign and in the, in the strategy. Um, I guess you could kind of come at it from the other way and say, hey, it's stages of change and then ask all your questions around the stages of change in your research. But I think kind of being more broad in your research and then identifying a framework that, that would fit it maybe makes a little bit more sense. But yeah, that's a good question. All right. Thank you. Very good question. And, and it's a good prompt for me to say that our next webinar in April is going to be on behavioral economics um, to change behavior. So that, you know, I think over time we'll get to learn a little bit more about these theories and how to apply them. Okay, Kelly, thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we uh, start the wrap up here. Thank you again for your amazing questions, participation, for being with us. Uh, Fightback.org is a resource for you on food safety and hand hygiene. Um, we have materials that you can use with small groups and one-on-one -on -one, uh, materials designed for the consumer and to reinforce messages around clean, separate, cook, chill, uh, preparing different foods, grilling, convenience foods, produce. Um, we have many, many resources. And if you're on our e-list, you're aware of that. Uh, Kelly referenced uh, work we did last year launched in time for our conference. It's a really fantastic tool for you. It's an evaluation toolbox and guide, all online, all free. The components of this guide are a good um, complement to this webinar series because it really helps you look at the design um, of your program, the evaluation of your program. It's very into tools for you. Um, just a real wealth of, of information that if you don't, you're not able to afford more training in this area, hopefully this online toolkit gives you and your staff a lot of what you might need to advance this kind of work in consumer food safety education. So please check that out. That was developed by um, a collaboration between the Partnership for Food Safety Education and the Food and Drug Administration. Um, it's a terrific resource and we will always refer you back to it. Um, we, we want to salute our primary funder partners who make this kind of event possible, Cargill Conagra, the FMI Foundation, NSF International, and TMA. Uh, their financial support of the partnership helps us serve this network of food safety educators across the United States and even beyond. So thank you um, to them for 
helping us keep doing our work. We are a partnership, and our partners are in scientific and professional organizations, private companies, trade industry associations, the leading uh, food commodity groups, the, um, the U.S. federal agencies, Food and Drug Administration, U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're truly a partnership. Uh, supporters of the Backfighter Community Connectors help us with um, our conference, which is in March 2019, and also with events like this. We thank them for their support. I want to give you a couple of reminders before we wrap up. One is that a survey is going to pop up right away. We want you to respond to it. Kelly referenced the question we asked in there about some of the more subtleties of implementing um, behavior change. And um, from that information, we, be, we will be able to inform the speakers on the next couple webinars of things you're most interested in. Please take that survey. Thank you again to Kelly, to Andrew, uh, to my team, Shante and Brittany, for their support. Here's how to get a hold of us. Um, the next webinar in the series is April 18th. The next webinar of the partnership is going to be March 21st on long-term health effects of foodborne illness. And as Kelly's story pointed out at the beginning about her friend's boy, um, this is of interest to all of us to be informed of what are the long-term health consequences. So please plan to join us March 21st and again, April 18th, hold those dates. Um, thank you for being with us. And at this point, we're gonna end the webinar. Kelly, be safe. And to all of you, we look forward to our next event with you. Remember to get your CEU handout. And thank you. Thank you.